So, quick question. Uh, how many of you were not alive on uh, September the 5th, 1977? Can you put your hand up, please? Okay. Okay, you put your hands down. So, by definition, by the way, just so you know, the Bible would refer to you as a young person. A young person. Some of you might not feel that way, but that's what the Bible would say. I just wanted to take a second. I wanted to say thank you. The fact that you're here in church in some ways defies the odds. It definitely defies the uh, statistics. And we don't take it for granted. Southside has always been a church where we have a lot of young men and young women who aren't waiting around for a time to come when they can start changing the world. They're doing it right now. And we do not take that for granted. Now, next question. How many of you were alive September 5th, 1977? Okay. I want to tell you something. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being someone who didn't walk in this church and look around and say, oh, this isn't for me because this is for you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your perspective. And the fact that you, at some point in your life, have decided that uh, there is no good time to stop changing the world. Now, the reason why I picked September 5th, 1977, is because on September the 5th, 1977, NASA launched the Voyager 1 spacecraft from Cape Canaveral, Florida. And the mission of Voyager 1 was to explore the planets of our solar system and beyond. Kind of like Toy Story, right? To infinity and beyond. Uh, the, the trajectory that, that Voyager 1 took was a, a slingshot maneuver around uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune. And every time it did a slingshot, it picked up speed. In 2012, uh, Voyager 1 left our solar system. And it became the first spacecraft ever to enter what is called interstellar space. It's traveling at about 60,000 kilometers an hour right now. Just steaming through interstellar space. So that's a picture of Voyager 1 right there. You might notice if you look carefully that there's a, uh, it's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, just to give you a perspective. And, and on the front of Voyager 1 there, you see a, a gold circle that looks in the shape of a record that you play on a record player. And the reason why that is is because it's a record that you play on a record player, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's a copper record encased in gold with a clear aluminum cover. And on that cover are etched um, instructions on where to find the record player that is also included on Voyager 1, uh, the speed to play the record, uh, the direction, and the place to place the stylus. And, and the purpose of what is known, by the way, as the golden record, you can Google it if you want, it was to uh, give intelligent life forms from other planets, should we meet them, uh, a picture of what life is like on Earth. There's about 100 pictures included on that record. You say, well, why didn't they use a thumb drive? Uh, it was September 5th, 1977. And there were no such thing as thumb drives. In fact, uh, the, 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 the record that you play in a record player was the latest uh, technology at that time of how to convey information. There's pictures of all different kinds of environments and climates and vegetation and human experience. There's uh, people eating and people shopping and people kissing. There's all sorts of audio. You can listen to the golden record on iTunes if you would like. There's um, bird songs and whale songs, wind and waves. Uh, there are uh, greetings from all over the world, different greetings. The last of the greetings on the golden record I have for you to listen right now. This is six-year-old Nick uh, Sagan. And Hello from the children of planet Earth. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Earth. Six-year-old Nick Sagan, son of Carl Sagan, who I'll talk about in a few minutes. There's 27 songs on the golden record from all over the world. I looked at all 27 of them, and I could only recognize one. And the one that I recognized was Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry. And so as I've been preparing for uh, this sermon, that song has been running through my head all week long. And so I'm going to share the love with you, and hopefully I can make the song run through your head for the rest of this week. In fact, I have a little bit of a rock uh, history trivia question for you, and if someone can get it, uh, they get a Wonder Bar, because that's always the prize that I hand out, is, is a Wonder Bar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote the lyrics that have been running through my head all week long to you, and when I stop, the first one who can uh, complete the, the lyrics, not the whole thing, just like the, the sentence, um, we, we don't need that, um, 
gets a wonder bar. You ready? Okay, so way down in Louisiana, close to New Orleans, way back among the woods, among the evergreens, there stood a log cabin made of earthen wood where lived a country boy named Johnny B. Good. He never, ever learned to read or write so well, but he could play a guitar. Like a ring a Right there, right there. What's your name? Paul. Paul, let's give Paul a hand. Good job, Paul. Rock historian. <laughs> Bad throw? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> terrible, terrible throw by me. Uh, the President of the United States at, at the time sent this message on Voyager 1. Uh, this is a present from a small, distant world, a token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts, and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so that we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope and our determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. It's amazing. 41 years ago, humanity sent Voyager 1 on a mission. And it's currently steaming through interstellar space at 60,000 kilometers an hour. Um, I wanted to show you uh, some of the pictures that it took along the way. I just have a few to show you. They're pretty amazing. Um, there's me. I'm up in the... Okay, there... Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's Jupiter. Uh, just amazing picture. And then here, here, here's another one of the atmosphere of... Can you go back one? one? Uh, I, don't remember the, I don't remember the name of the largest moon in Jupiter, but you can see it in the, kind of the bottom left. Okay, next one. Uh, that's the atmosphere of Jupiter. And on the top right-hand side, you see that red spot. It's known as the Great Red Spot. Okay, and it's, it's, it's a permanent... Um, high pressure system in Jupiter's atmosphere. What I found really interesting about this picture, well, number one, it's breathtaking. And number two, below the great red spot, you see that silver circle there? Uh, that's a storm in the atmosphere of Jupiter, and the diameter of that storm is equal to the diameter of the planet Earth, to give you a sense of scope. Uh, one more. That's Saturn. Seems sort of creative to me, you know? It's amazing. But I got to thinking, what's the, miss it, the, the mission of Voyager? To explore the planets of our solar system and beyond. So if, if, if I had to boil it down even more than that, if I wanted to boil down the, the mission of the Voyager spacecraft, I would probably say, in one word, the mission is more. We're just looking for more, you know? Explore the planets of our solar system and beyond. More. Just more. And as I began thinking of that, I thought of three things, because I always seem to think in threes. I was thinking that, you know, we all know there's got to be more. There is more. And you can't get there from here. <laughs> I'll explain. But, but first of all, we, we all know there's got to be more. There is more. But you can't get there from here. So the first thing I want to talk about today is the fact that I believe that we all know there's got to be more. I want to show you one more picture taken by the Voyager 1. Um, Because on Valentine's Day of 1990, the scientists at NASA told the Voyager 1 to turn its cameras around back towards Earth. At at, at the time, um, on February 14th, 1990, Voyager was near Pluto. It was about 6 billion kilometers away from Earth. And this is the picture it took. That picture has become the most famous astronomical photograph of all time. It's known as the pale blue dot. Yeah, you can leave it up for a bit. At the time, Carl Sagan, father of Nick Sagan, who recorded his six-year-old version of Greeting, was the most famous astronomer on Earth. And this is what he said about the pale blue dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam.
pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. So what, six months ago, as I was looking at that picture, I came up with the title for this series, and the title is Small. Small. We're a small, pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. And what I would suggest to you today is that inside of you and inside of me, there is this notion, there is this knowledge, there is this certainty that there's got to be more. That, that surely existence and meaning and life has to be more than what we experience on this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Like you look around this world some days and you see sickness and pain and anger and war and struggle and heartbreak. And there's something inside of us, I believe, that, 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 that looks at, at those parts of, of this world, this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam, and we say, that's wrong. Like, that, that, that pain, that sickness, that despair, that anxiety, that depression, that darkness, that's wrong. That deep down inside of you, deep down inside of me, there's something that says, no, that's not right. And what it would suggest is if we look at something and say that's wrong, what it means is that we're longing for something that is right. Something more than what we experience on this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. I would even take that a step further. That there's something about even the best moments that we experience on this pale blue dot that seem to, at best, point us to something more. You know, like the, the, the awards that we win, the accolades we receive, the, the, um, the victories that we experience, that they, they seem to just be like a bit of an echo pointing to the fact that there's got to be something more, that there's got to be a feeling that's just beyond my grasp. There's got to be a vision that's just beyond my ability to see it. That, 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 that there's got to be something just a little bit more than this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Last weekend, we were in Calgary visiting our 24-year-old son, Lucas. And um, during the weekend, we were driving up between, on Highway 2 in Alberta between Calgary and Red Deer. And there was a point when we were driving that I looked off uh, to my right, and I saw rolling hills and farmer's fields, which is pretty much what you see driving between Calgary and Red Deer. And, there was a, the, the, and it hit me just for a second. I remembered a moment. I, I don't remember how old I was, but I just remember this moment. Lying down in a field of wheat on a beautiful sunny day. I remember the dragon flies buzzing, the birds soaring, the sound that the wind makes in the wheat, the clouds drifting slowly across my vision. And, and as I looked out the window of the car, as we were driving between Calgary and Red Deer, I thought, man, I just want to go back there. I just want to be back in that moment. <laughs> but then I started asking myself, okay, like how would that work out? I know where it was. It was near Pine Lake, Alberta, where, where, where I grew up. I could, I could find that ranch, and I could go there, and I could find that farmer's field, and I could lie down. However, my parents don't own that field anymore, and so I would guess that someone would have called the police, and I'd be arrested, okay? But, but beyond that, I don't know that it would be everything that I need it to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that the best moments that we have on this planet on this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Like, they give us a taste, a glimpse of something that we long for that's a little bit more than what we're experiencing. 
yesterday we put up our Christmas tree. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. You know what I mean? Uh, so Corinne really wanted to put up the Christmas tree, so we did. I just threw her under the bus. You know, it was her fault. Um, but Christmas is a little bit like that. There's some part of us that we just, there's something about Christmas that, that may, 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 maybe it's just that moment that we remember. And we want to go back there. And I love Christmas, and I love everything we celebrate, and I, I, I love all the parties, and I love all the social, I love it all. But do you know what the most depressed month of the year is in our culture? January. Why? Partly to pay bills, yeah. But, but, but partly because what we were looking for was the ultimate, but it didn't quite deliver. I think that we all know there's got to be more. The Bible says it this way, that God has placed eternity in the human heart. So when we look around the world and we go, that, that, that pain, that sickness, that brokenness, that darkness, that's wrong. What it points to is, is a longing for a place or a time or a situation when the wrong is going to be made right. And even beyond that, when we experience the best that this world has to offer, it seems sometimes like an echo or a glimpse or the beginning of something that we desperately want more of. One of my favorite thinkers is a 20th century, 20th century writer by the name of C.S. Lewis. He, he addressed this, and I want to read you a quote. It's long. But I ask you just to really, really focus in because it's incredible. It's well worth your while. This is what he said. Most people know that they do want something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us <coughs> are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. There was something we grasped at in that first moment of longing, which just fades away in the reality. I think every, everyone knows what I mean. The wife may be a good wife, and the hotels and scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may be a very interesting job, but something has evaded us. Now, there are two wrong ways of dealing with this, and one right one. The first wrong one is the fool's way. The fool puts the blame on the things themselves. He goes on all his life thinking that if only he had tried another woman or went for a more expensive holiday or whatever it is, then this time he really would catch the mysterious something that we are all after. The fool s spends their whole life trotting from woman to woman through divorce courts, from continent to continent, from hobby to hobby, always thinking that the latest is the real thing at last and always disappointed. The second wrong way is the disillusioned way. The sensible man decides that the whole thing was moonshine. Of course, he says, one feels like that when one's young, but by the time you get to my age, you've given up chasing the rainbow's end. And so he settles down and learns not to expect too much and represses the part of himself which used to, as he would say, cry for the moon. The third way is the Christian way. The Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hungry while well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim while well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire while well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it. To suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand to never s despise or be unthankful for 
these earthly blessings. And on the other, never to mistake them for something, for the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and to help others do the same. Yeah, old CS was pretty smart. I believe that we all know there's got to be more. I, I believe that when we look around and we see everything that's wrong in this world, the sickness and the despair and, and the darkness and the strife, that there's something deep inside of your soul that says, that's wrong. Assuming, of course, that there's got to be something else that is right. And I would even go further and suggest that when you put your head on your pillow at night, that even the best that this world has to offer arouses in us a glimpse or a longing for something that's just a little bit more. And as C.S. Lewis said, I, I think there's three ways to deal with it. Number one, we can get resentful. You know, I, I've said it this way before. We, we shake our fist at the fickle finger of fate. That it's everybody else's fault. That it's my job's fault. That it's my spouse's fault. That it's my friend's fault. That it's my... Like, that, 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 that somehow I deserve more, but it's just making me angry that I'm not achieving it. So we can be resentful. Or secondly, we can be resigned. It's just a big cosmic joke. You know, there, there, there's something inside of me that, that knows there's got to be more, but I've, I've decided that it's just a joke. That it's just there to frustrate me. That I'm never going to be finally fully satisfied and I just have to get over it. But I want to suggest to you in this series a third way. And so the first way is resentment and the second way is re resignation. The third way is rest. We, we, we rest in the truth that if I find in myself a longing for nothing that this country can satisfy, the most logical explanation is I was made for another country, another world. And that brings me to point two. So, so point one says this. We all know there's got to be more. That deep inside of you and deep inside of me, we look around and we think, that's wrong, which implies that we're longing for an existence or a time or a place where the wrong is going to be made right. And that deep inside of you, deep inside of me, that there's a feeling that, that the best that this world has to offer, is, it just arouses in me a need for, a desire for something that's just beyond my grasp. So number one, we all know there's got to be more. Number two, there is more. Isn't it amazing? 41 years ago, Voyager 1 was launched. And right now, as we speak, it is steaming through. I don't know why I say steaming. Steaming through. Uh, toot toot. You know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's steaming through interstellar space at 60,000 kilometers an hour. What's it finding? I don't know. I bet, it, bet it's incredible. Amazing. Majesty. Magnificence. So 41 years ago, humanity went on a mission into the heavens to find more. And I think I have some really good news for us today. The Lord of the heavens, the creator of the universe, our heavenly Father has sent word. There is more. In the Bible in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, written by the Apostle Paul, inspired by God, it says this, that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of what God has prepared for those who love him. That there is more. 
There, there is an existence, there is a time, there is a place when the wrong will be made right. When all those longings and desires that I have that I felt like never quite will, uh, were satisfied will come to fruition. Just before Jesus died on the cross, he sat down with his disciples to encourage them. He said this, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. 41 years ago, humanity sent a spacecraft on a mission into the heavens to find more. And the good news is that the Lord of the heavens the creator of the universe, our heavenly father has sent word. There is more. There, 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 there is a place, there is a time, there is an existence when the wrong will be made right. When those tastes and those desires that we feel that are just beyond our grasp will fr- finally come to fruition. See, this series is about heaven. Heaven. And whether you're here today for the first time or you've been at church your whole life, I I really believe that this series can change us. That when, when we know what awaits us, we can live differently today. So Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he goes on and he says, "Uh, you know the way to the place where I'm going. That's interesting. Thomas says what you would have said. He certainly says what I would have said. Uh, We don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? (laughs) You know, if I knew the way, I would definitely, you know, pop that into my Google Maps and I would be headed there right now. So that brings me to my third point today. Point one. We all know there's got to be more. You understand? We, we, we look around the world and, and, and we see pain and we see brokenness and we d- see despair and we see darkness and we say that's wrong, which implies that we know that there's got to be a time, there's got to be existence, there's got to be a place when the wrong is made right. Or we experience or see or, or have the best that this world has to offer and all it seems to do is awaken in us a desire for more. We all know there's got to be more. Number one, number two, there is more. You know that if I find in myself, desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, the logical explanation is I was made for more than this world, more than this pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Point three, you can't get there from here. (laughs) You can't get there from here. Jesus says, oh, you know the way. And Thomas says, no, I don't. Jesus answers this way. I am the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. 41 years ago, humanity went on a mission into interstellar space to find more. Here's the good news. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven and came to earth to bring us more. He came to where we are. That's what he said, right? I will come back and take you to be with me. He, he came to where we are to bring us to where he is. 41 years ago, <laughs> humanity, and I love it, it's awesome. We went on a mission into interstellar space, into the heavens to find more. Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
left heaven and came to earth. And he came to bring us more. So as I close today, I I guess I want to go back to that C.S. Lewis quote from earlier. I firmly believe that inside of you and inside of me that we all know there's got to be more. So how are you going to handle that? There's really three choices. Resentment, resignation, or rest. I I wonder how you've been feeling lately. Like, I, I, I wonder if you've been looking around lately wondering why can't I find the more that I've been looking for? It can make you angry, you know? You start to shake your fists. Or I wonder if you've hit a point in your life where you've hit resignation, where you've given up on wonder, that you've given up on majesty, that you've given up on magnificence, that you've given up on joy, that you've given up on beauty, that you've given up on the more that God placed the desire for inside of you. See, I, I believe the third option is the option that we all need to take. And that third option is rest. We rest in Jesus. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. <laughs> it's good. And I'm going to take you there. In Matthew 11, he said it this way, come to me if you are weary or burdened and I will give you rest. 41 years ago humanity went on a mission into the heavens to find more. Well, 2,000 years ago Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven and came to earth. He was born in a manger in a stable in a little town called Bethlehem. He came to where We are. He grew up and at about the age of 30, he started traveling around preaching and he and he preached. He preached about wonder. He preached about majesty. He preached about grace and love and hope. He preached about more. And eventually the tide of public opinion turned against Jesus and he was nailed to a Roman cross where he suffered and died. And the reason he died (coughs) is so that your sins could be forgiven. So that your sins could be taken away. I want to explain that just for a second because I think that's really important. The minimum requirement for heaven is perfection. How are you doing with that? The the minimum requirement for salvation is perfection. How's that going for you? Because heaven itself is a place where all the wrongs will be made right. In other words, sin has no place in heaven. So what do I do now? Maybe you're looking up at this stage right now thinking, well, I'll tell you what, I'm a lot closer to perfection than the guy on the stage. I completely agree. You're way closer than Jason, okay? Like, no doubt about it. (laughs) I get it, right? Like, if if this is perfection, um, your your angle is a lot closer than mine. But I was thinking about it as I was praying for you this week. And, and, And I thought about February the 14th, 1990, when Voyager 1 turned its cameras around and took a picture of us, a pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Six billion kilometers. So I have a question for you. What what if you were just 0.01 degree off of perfection? What does that look like six billion kilometers from now? We got some tech nerds in the back. And so when I asked that question in the first service, one of them texted me right afterwards and they said, what it looks like is this. If you were aiming for Earth, you'd hit Mars. So let me ask you this question. So in light of eternity, how is your near perfection working for you? That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to forgive our sins, to wipe them clean. 
When Jesus died on the cross, he said, hand me all your sin and I'll give you perfection. And on the third day after Jesus died, he rose again. And I believe that Jesus rose so that you and me can too. He he invites us down this road called life that starts now and it stretches into eternity. He he invites us on this journey that, that, that even when this world gets hard, that he will be with us every single step of the way. Psalm 23 says it this way, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because he's with me every single step of the way and he will bring me safely to the other side. So where you at? Here's what I know. Every single one of us knows there's got to be more. And Jesus is the more that we have all been looking for. So as I close today, I just want to take a moment of reflection. If you don't mind, could you bow your heads and close your eyes? Jesus wants to forgive your sins. He wants to give you strength for today. He wants to give you hope for tomorrow. And he wants to secure your eternity. He's the more that you've been looking for. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again for you. And now his invitation is this. Hey, hey, follow me. So today I want to give you that opportunity. All you got to do is ask. If today is the day that you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life to forgive your sins, to give you strength today, hope tomorrow, and the promise of eternity, right now, if you want to do that for the first time, can you just raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you. That's awesome. Nice and high, please. It's great, man. There's something significant about responding on the outside to what God is doing on the inside. I love it. Okay, you can put your hands down. So if you just raised your hand, I'm going to pray out loud, and you can pray along with me silently. Dear Jesus, thank you that you came on a journey 2,000 years ago for me. Today, Jesus, I hand you my sin. I ask that you would forgive it. Get it out of my way. Pray that you would forgive all my sin, past, present, and future. Today, Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. I pray that you give me the strength to take the steps that I need to take today and tomorrow and for the days to come. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the more that I've been looking for and that you died so I can live eternally. Thank you. In your name. Amen. Can we celebrate that, church? Is that okay? Just one more thing before I close today. And maybe you're, you're here and you've been a Christian for decades. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, I don't know. But lately you've been feeling that, that same thing, you know. That sometimes this world makes you angry and you lose hope. Or sometimes you just give up. And, and I want to pray for us. I want to pray for you and I want to pray for me. That, that we would understand that we have, a, we have a Savior who still loves us will always love us and is with us every single step of the way. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you. May we live today with eternity in mind. May we understand that we have been loved to such a degree that that love can overflow to the people around us. That you give us strength to such a degree that that strength can overflow to the people around us. That you give us hope that is contagious. That you give us joy that makes a difference. Father, thank you that you were with me every single step of the way and that you always will be. Pray that you would give us the strength and the ability to make a difference in this world as we look forward to a place where every wrong will be made right and every need will be completely and finally and totally fulfilled in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week. See you next week.
Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you at any of our three Sunday services held at Sardis Secondary School on Stevenson Road in Chilliwack, British Columbia. For more information, please visit southsidelife.com.